just briefly, nutrient cycling in the environment. And what this is, I just want to introduce this. The kind of the areas that we're going to touch on are kind of, we have already have a little bit. But talking about the air part, and I'm going to have um, Keith first talk about the groundwater, surface water, and most importantly, the soils piece. And then I'll kind of come back and talk about the air fraction of this and where your nutrients are moving and how and all these pieces. And just in general, what is the issue? And know this, but yes, your cows make a lot of manure. And I always joke that sometimes milk is a byproduct of your daily manure production on your farm. So we've got a lot of that, 100 pounds per cow um, on average. And then we've got this agronomic rate, this nutrient balance piece. And this is what we're trying to balance, is that we apply nutrients to crops. In a perfect world, the crops take up exactly what you put on, because that was exactly what they needed. And those nutrients come back in your system, and you kind of have this closed loop. But this doesn't really happen. There always is some type of an exit. Even if you're under applying, you're still probably going to lose a little bit of that. Because as was mentioned, there's some loss no matter what, about you can say 40% on average is either tied up in your soil and becomes available later, or is lost to volatilization or to nitrate. It just moves <coughs> around and gets around. So we do have a little bit of loss there. And if it is in the soil, hopefully this comes back and applies, you know, it's available later for those crops and enters back into the system. When we get it lost in the air, uh, that is what it is. Actually, your neighbors may get it. When you get ammonia volatilization, for instance, it can deposit maybe only a mile away, right back on your fields or someone else's, a portion of that. It just doesn't go very far if we've got nice, stable conditions. Otherwise, it could be lost in surface water runoff or to groundwater. And so this is the area that we're trying to minimize those losses, obviously, right? So in one way or another, kind of stop the movement of this. And, um, and there are easy ways to do that. And so I'm going to turn it now over. Yeah. Here you go. So the wet soil service, which one up? Yeah. So there you go. Hi, my name is Keith Harrington. I'm a soil scientist with NRCS. I really don't work with cooperators. I go out and do dirt, and that's what I do. So a lot of your stuff, answer questions, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. I may not be able to answer them all. Um, I want to take a step back real quick and basically go back to Soils 101. Soil is made up of sand, silt, and clay, are the three size particles. Sand, you all know, think of beach sand. Water moves through that really quick. So does nitrates, so does nitrogen. Sand has no cation exchange capacity, or very little, so it doesn't glum hold of those nutrients. Clay glums hold of them, and you might not be able to get, get them back. So you've got to think of what your soil is made up of to think how fast water moves through it, how quick, or excuse me, how quick water moves through it, and how it glums onto these materials. Also, NRCS is promoting soil health a lot this year. I've been to a lot of soil health presentations, and the more organic matter you have, like your manures, your cover crops and stuff, that is tremendous, makes a tremendous difference of how much that'll hold on to your nutrients, your pesticides, all the stuff you want to keep in the soil and don't run out, want it running off. So with that, um, just let me get into, um, I want to introduce you, some of you may have already know it, some of you haven't, I want to introduce you to what NRCS is kind of showing for Web Soil Survey. This is on the web. And um, you just type in Web Soil Survey. This is a really, really good spot for it if you want to do a risk, risk assessment on your soil. You and can. This should be. Um, we have maps in your plans. If you've updated them in the past <coughs> of several years, you should have a set of maps that are colored with a risk ass assessment on it. For leaching, and if you don't, come talk to us and we'll get you one, or you can get it from here yourself. It's a very important to have it. There's several ways you can get your your look. You can type in your click on this, type in your address. I'm just going to go to state and county. And the cool one right here. I 
I think that's NRCS. <laughs> I can try to remove that website. Oh, there, there we go. go. Yeah, it's oftentimes. It's a little slower. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you can't bear with me. It's always slow. Yeah, it's just, just that's part of the characteristic of it. You've got to set aside several hours and get to your form. That's the website. Well, that's not good. Okay. We're just gonna kind of. I'll try to possibly this. Maybe you can talk, and I'll try to. I'll try to wing it. Without you can go in and you can type in your address, and your address and your your farm will come on up. You can type in the city or the county, which I just did, um, I did at my office this morning, working fine. I typed in Yakima County, Washington State, Yakima County, and then yeah, all, all of Yakima County will come up. And I apologize that this isn't working. Um, but you can go in there and you note know your farm. And I have handouts that everybody, um, might as well give them out since One thing I want to let you know, one word of caution, 
So I'm going to hit a scale sign. And I take a ruler, because I want this to scale, I take a ruler and I drive this little line down here to one inch. But anyway, you drag it to one inch and hit the scale. And it will give you your scale. Because okay, the scale is 1 to 23,000. If you want to zoom in, you can zoom in. The one thing is, this is mapped to 1 to 24,000. So if you zoom in and zoom in, you get more resolution. But it's mapped to 1 to 24,000. Imagine Nevis, you see Nevis or the gentleman over here in the corner with his tie. You see him walking in the room. You know he's wearing a tie. This is kind of like scale. He gets up next to you and you say, oh, he has a little snowman on his tie. That's kind of just like the survey is. They did it 1 to 24,000, and probably on your farm map or your plan map, they zoom into 1 to 3,000. It's showing things that the original soil mappers never saw. You're seeing a lot better scale. Is that clear? Okay, so these are the soils on that dairy. The numbers, not the numbers of the soil. What's that? The numbers. The numbers, yeah. So, like up here, right here is 120. So, this is zoomed down. Here's 120. It's a spoon. So, long. Okay, now you know that silt does not have much clay in it, so it's not going to hold nutrients really well. It's going to hold it better in the sand, but it's not going to hold it really well. So you know that. Click on that spoon, and the silt loam name is just for the surface texture. So zero to six inches, you have a silt loam. Six to 60 inches, you have a gravelly, very fine sandy loam. It's going to hold nutrients even less. And then 16 to 60 inches, you have cement material like a dirt can. So you only have a 16 inch soil for the spoon loan. So you're going to have problems. If stuff's going to go down, it's going to hit that cement layer and go run off on top of that cement layer. You only have 16 inches of soil to work with. How is the data collected to put it all on? The data is collected. We've done soil surveys since the in our SIP, well, back in the day we were so SCS that put it all in. In SCS and in our CS, we put it all together. Um, it's being updated as we speak, but it's being updated. There's three of us on each side of the cascade, so we can work for our, you know, error. It's not good being updated really quick, but we're trying to do the best we can. But then I go over to Soil Data Explorer, and I'm going to go, oh, is that to me? Land Management. associations, which means they have one major soil. Sometimes you have an alpha beta soil. Sometimes the name will be alpha beta. Um, and you need to pick, when you run this, you need to pick for dominant condition, dominant soil. So maybe you have an alpha beta complex where alpha is 55%, beta is 45%. Alpha could be a deep soil, beta could be a shallow soil. So you need to pick, do you want dominant condition, do you want dominant soil? Just let you know, and Yakima, it looks like everything is more associations, one's main soil. But just be aware of that. So anyway, we're viewing the rating for this, and um, okay, so there's the rating. 
I did this presentation a while back ago and they go, oh my god, it's all red, it's terrible. <laughs> no, red does not mean terrible, green does not mean good. Red is a color, green is a color, yellow is a color, blue is a color. You need to come down and read the description to figure out if it's good or bad. Okay, and so I was trying to find that spoon. There we go. I just went past it. Sorry. There it is. Schoon. The erodibility of the leaching potential is high because of water travel time and available water capacity. So what the heck does that mean to the lay user? So I would really encourage you to go down and read the description of what's going on. And if you don't understand it, and sometimes I don't understand it, feel free to call me or Kevin or anybody in NRCS and I'll try to give you the right answer. So there's that guide for your potential leaching. Sat, which is how quick your water will move. 
through your water, through your soils. So you can look at it and say, this is my, you know, it's a sandy thing, you ought to take it and move quick, but it actually has a race of how quick your water will move through your soils. Again, it doesn't take into, if you're doing soil health and have a lot of organic matter, that will kind of affect it. And so it doesn't take everything into effect. Um, the one thing is this is a great general tool, but if you're going to site a reservoir or a sewage lagoon, don't do it based on this. You need site-specific information. Work with the district or somebody have us come out and look at it. And so with that, I think um, I'm getting into this. And any questions? <laughs> transfer to the air quality part of things. So if you do have any questions, um, we'll be around for a little while. So just the transfer back, um, as I mentioned. Uh, I'm going to just kind of talk about the air quality side of things a little bit more. Um, so. Kevin kind of went over the soil, and, and on that web soil survey, yes, it, it was moving a little slow here, and it will even move a little slow at home. But if you're able to get on there, it's easy to pull up your farm, as you saw, and you can just go through and click on things and just learn a little bit more about your soils. And, and if you don't know what it means or anything else, these guys are wonderful and always available, um, and you've got their contact information, uh, either from NRCS um, and or Lori and Landon as well from your Yakima Conservation District, uh, who can always help with those things. So let's kind of uh, move, I guess, north into the air part of things. And just a little bit of an overview on ag emissions to air. And there are quite a lot of things, as any industry, anywhere, anytime. But um, some of the bigger things that we either you hear about or something, and I'm just going to do a brief overview on most of this. We've got odor, of course, um, particulate matter, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, volatile organic compounds, greenhouse gases. And it's these two things, this odor and particulate matter is dust, essentially. These are the things that matter to you because these are the things people can see and smell and that they'll complain about. These are the things on your farm that are more, most obvious to you. Ammonia is, yes, you can smell that and you can relatively see that once that leaves your farm a little ways, though, it's very hard to tell like where is that and I can't see it it's not blue or anything else it can be a challenging hydrogen sulfide again um, these volatile organic compounds this is also a challenging one where those come from and then the greenhouse gases of course this is a real challenging one you can't see these you can't smell them uh, they just are and they're not a local consideration they're more of a global challenge and issue so a lot of these types of things when it comes to air emissions we just know where on farm those come from, and we, via chemistry and calculation, if you will, can kind of figure out what is your potential contribution and how we can reduce these things. But I want to focus on, on these three because these are kind of our biggest concerns in this area, the things that you'll hear most about, the things you can do the most things about. Volatile organic compounds, for instance, this is primarily from your silage. So these are produced during anaerobic conditions such as silage fermentation. And when you break that uh, face of your silage, that's when things like uh, VOCs are released. So th that's kind of a little bit more challenging. Hydrogen sulfide, this comes from your lagoons, areas where it is anaerobic or no oxygen for the most part happening. So that's where we get that release. So I want to individually kind of address these. But just a brief, one thing that's an interesting part about air emissions is that they happen on every part of your farm, including your fields. They're everywhere. And it's just the relative amount of when and where. But they kind of all are connected in some way. So something like ammonia in particular, which is why I addressed this one, it can be in every single phase from your barns, your milk parlor, to your manure storage, to application, to your feed values, etc. And what's interesting about that is if you do a really good job in your barn and you, are, you have barely any ammonia emissions, ammonia is nitrogen, right? So it's going to, great, you did a superb job here, and so it's going to move on to the next place you've conserved it. But in, let's say, your 
manure, kind of storage issues, you're really not doing anything at all, Poop, it can all just blow right off or out in your field when you apply it. So all that you do, all the work you may do on farm to conserve nitrogen, if you're not doing good practices on your fields, it's just all going to be available for loss. So ammonia is a real tricky one in that way, and I'll show you another slide. But something like methane, it's very point source. It's really, um, most of those emissions come from your lagoon, for instance. So we're kind of concerned about it in this spot. We don't really see it as much on the fields or other areas. So it's a little bit challenging in that respect on, well, you know, how do I deal with this? So we'll just pick a couple for you to focus on. Um, but essentially, when we talk about these, we have to work in a systems approach. We have to look at your whole farm so that we're not doing a great job somewhere and then all of that effort is lost somewhere else. You want to look at it as, as a whole system. And so uh, let's talk about odor first. And I bring this one up because it's always what people talk about, and I hate it as an air quality scientist because it's not one thing. It's a combination of things. And every odor has a different signature. It's like hair color. Sure, we may all kind of have brown hair, but it's a little different shade. And I've got grays and you've got reds. You know, it's different. That's what odor is. It's, yeah, we all have hair, but it's not all the same. So it's really, really challenging, and it's very hard to measure, measure. It's very hard to quantify impact. Steve brought a great conversation. Well, is this stuff harmful to people? Well, people think odors are harmful to them, but they're not necessarily. But it, it, it creates this emoted spot, response from people, this emotional response, like, oh, if I can smell it. I'm sure it's killing me. You know, No, it's not true. So it's a challenge, right? Odor is really hard. And it comes from everywhere. And the odors from every place are going to be different. There's a different signature on every different source of your farm. And as I mentioned, the impact, for the most part, it's a nuisance. This is what you have to deal with, with if you have neighbors and you have to deal with them, it's most likely dust and odor issues. And odor for you, there are some that are a little bit more obvious. Land application is probably one of the most obvious sources because it's a little bit more spread out and you're doing land application at certain times and you know exactly when that happens, so it's an obvious source. So that's an easy one, hopefully, to work with your neighbors on if they have a backyard picnic happening or something. You just wait a day or something of that nature. Otherwise, they're very hard to deal with, um, but they drive a lot of issues. And as I mentioned, odor is very subjective on its impact. So someone, uh, and this is the hardest part of that, I kind of joke about this psychophysiological health impact where someone smells it and they think they're having an issue. But people truly can smell something and have a response. Your body can be conditioned that if you smell something that you don't like, emotionally your brain can create a headache or some other response. It may not be real, but it's happening. And it's really hard. And there's a variety of different studies and things out about this. And it just makes odor that much more challenging to deal with. So people may not have something that's life-threatening, but their body creates a response. And you may have this too. And I was telling a friend of mine, my husband is extremely stubborn. When he's a kid, he hated tomatoes. And his mom would make him eat them. And he would make himself throw up after he ate them just by will, just sheer will. He would just and just amazingly throw up. And I always think about that here. I was like, he was just doing it out of stubborn, but his body did that. So it's, it, odor to me is one of those kind of crazy things in that respect. Um, so it makes it really hard. This, it'll drive you crazy. But you do the best you can on minimizing those. And let's take another step and let's talk about ammonia because ammonia is an odorant and it is probably one of the larger ones um, on your farm. And this is something that you can do uh, something about. And just a real quick little basic chemistry, and I talked about this earlier. The one thing about ammonia and why we have a double concern about it with someone like EPA and why ammonia, if anything on your farm, this will be the first regulated air pollutant most likely, is that ammonia is a basic atmospheric gas. All you have to know is it's basic and that there are acidic species out in the environment and brief chemistry, acids and bases just like to hang out. That's how it is. So, and there are very, very few basic atmospheric gases. So things that are acidic, and these are things like um, tailpipe emissions, things from combustion processes, 
So those are kind of our biggest sources of things called NOx and SOx. You may just hear this. I'm not going to get into chemistry too much today. But when these two things find each other, they very quickly and happily react and come together. And they create something called PM2.5. Or They're these very small particulates. You can't see them. Uh, the 2.5 part is the diameter of these. And that's microns. And a hair is about 60 microns across and these are 2.5. They're teeny tiny. So the problem with these is that that's what kind of leads to smog issues, pollution in the air, and that will happen during um, different times of the year, inversions, or during the summer, or whatever it may be. Um, and so these are contributors in that case, and so you'll get that kind of smog. And as I mentioned earlier too, this is a concern because when people breathe this in, they can truly have respiratory issues. So that is a potential issue. You might have been in the back of her. There's a lot of yawning. It's a little warm in here. So the challenge with you and with agriculture is that agriculture, all sources of agriculture, have been listed as the biggest contributor of ammonia. So it's about 60 to 75% of the total uh, source per, uh, apportionment. And of that, livestock is a pretty good sector that with chemical fertilizers also contributing. So there is quite a bit that's contributed from ag. So it is, um, ag is one of the leading sources to this. So how is ammonia produced from livestock? We've got two different ways. Uh, the first way is directly from your animals. So uh, your cattle urinate and there's something in there called urea nitrogen. You're probably familiar with this milk ni or milk urea nitrogen. So there's also urine urea nitrogen. And when that combines with urease, which is an enzyme found in soil and feces, it's everywhere. You can't really stop it. This little reaction produces ammonia gas. So just thinking about that, anywhere you have urine mixing with soil or feces, you'll have ammonia production. So that's everywhere. It's your barns, it's everywhere. And then once this comes together, when you've got that manure together, you're gonna have ammonia production off of there as well. So it's happening all over your farm. Ways that we can minimize this, one good thing is that when these things combine and you get them into a anaerobic, so no oxygen environment like your lagoon, this process goes down. This really likes air for it to happen. Um, so if you kind of clean out your barns uh, more regularly so you don't have it all kind of spread out on the surface, you can kind of reduce this reaction somewhat and you can get that readily in your lagoon. And this starts happening immediately within about 24 hours and you just had um, kind of a pile fall and you left it, all that ammonia that could volatilize has volatilized and it's just left the organic nitrogen and a little bit of ammonium left. So it happens pretty easily. Your other big source besides, let's say, your barns is land application. This is where you can lose, as I mentioned, up to half of your nitrogen if you apply, let's say, with a surface applicator of some type. So there's a lot you can do to minimize this. If you inject it, your losses could maybe be 2 to 5%, very small, if you get it right into the surface. If you do surface apply it, one way you want to think about is any way you can incorporate that in, so you irrigate right afterwards and the water, clean water, will push it off the leaf surface and get it somewhat into that soil. That will help reduce any type of volatilization. So you're conserving nitrogen. This is a great product you have on your farm. Yes, yeah, some of you are probably trying to blow it off. That happens. But for the most part, you want to keep this stuff and that's one way to do it. Huh. What does diluting it do? Diluting it, so like diluting your manure and then applying it. It, it'll somewhat reduce the potential. So the potential for this is based on how much <laughs> nitrogen you're putting out there. So diluting it just means that you're putting less total nitrogen out there so you have less ammonia that could volatilize off. So the more concentrated your manure, the more potential you have for ammonia loss because there's just more of it in the pool there. So diluting it will reduce those potential losses, but let's say you apply um, the same amount of total nitrogen on your acres, you just take two or three days to do it instead of one day, well, you, you still have the potential to lose all that if you're putting out the same amount of nitrogen, if that makes sense. So the point is that to really be good about your land application methods and try to reduce any potential volatilization, whether that is with going back over it. With uh, One thing, if you're doing drop hoses, for instance, if you have 
a really high pressure rate, and so that liquid in there is essentially atomizing. You have these tiny little spray droplets instead of these nice kind of big droplets. One way you can think of that is you've, all those tiny little droplets have a lot of surface area, and surface area is where that ammonia comes off of. So by atomizing it, you actually increase your volatilization. The bigger your drop, the less chance you have to lose it to the air. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. yeah another way to look at this too is, is uh, if you have a sequential separation and removal of nutrients, mm -hmm. then you're effectively reducing your application rate if yep. you're utilizing sprinklers in particular. Yep. So yeah, in this application rate, just by the way that it has to get through your hosing and, and tubing and everything else, your, your nutrient concentration is probably pretty low because you've taken it out with solid separation and everything else. Um, other areas too, so in between this, by the way, so when we think about our manure holding areas and processing, composting produces a lot of ammonia volatilization. So two things there, you're taking all of that raw manure and then you're putting it in piles and you're making a lot of surface area, you're spreading it out, you're turning it, you're giving it lots of oxygen, and it gives it the maximum potential for losing all of that volatile nitrogen. So that all comes out, and in the end, you like your product, it's a nice, stable, nitrogen, carbon balanced product, which is great for sales and for using, and et cetera. But that process volatilizes a lot of ammonia off of this nitrogen. And in some areas, like California, they're not allowed to compost for a while. They may be back on it. Um, and they had to do it in vessels, and they had to filter that air and do all sorts of things for ammonia remediation. So they've had all sorts of crazy things, and I hope they never get that far. But just uh, so you know some of your high points of on farm where that um, volatilization is really happening. Um, next, I want to move on to particulate matter, otherwise known as dust. And as I mentioned, we've got two main kinds that are discussed when you think about regulations and everything else. PM10, which is coarse dust, which you can see. And then there's these PM2.5, what I talked about, which are these tiny chemical particles, which you can only see when enough build up and you get that brown haze, for instance. So those are our two big ones. And they're created two different ways. Um, this kind of PM10, this kind of larger particle, that's created from mechanical production. Just think of it this way, from driving on roads, from your tractors, from your animals walking around in dry pens, etc. That's how it has to happen. It occurs when you shuffle around, that's dust. The other, as I mentioned, this secondary, that's a chemical reaction for those small particulates, and that's when ammonia comes in the picture and makes those. But it's these here, um, this source that is the most concerned that people can see and that creates big issues when we get big wind that comes through on dry fields without cover crops or something else and you lose a lot of soil. I mean when you see dust being blown around you're losing either soil off your fields that you've worked very hard to build over years. If it's in pens, maybe it's just a little bit of moisture management that needs to happen. Either there's ways you can do that, either if you've got set up for water application on your pens to keep them a little bit moist. You don't want them too wet because then we've got odor production. But somewhere around a magical number of 30% uh, moisture content, you're going to have that nice balance between odor and dust. And it's going to be right in there. And you learn that just by visual over time. I don't expect everyone out there with a little moisture meter figuring that out. Oh, just a little bit more now. You'll figure it out over time by balancing that. Another way you can do that is by crowding cattle a little bit or cutting off the dry part of the pens during their most active time of the day. Um, keeping them up a little bit further. Applying shades is a huge one. You probably do this for most of your good milk cows, but you can think about it for all of your cattle. Um, not only is it good performance, a lot of um, studies have shown, but also they'll congregate under that shade and they'll follow it and their manure will follow that shade and they kind of moisten it up for you as they move around. So later in the day, they'll probably start spreading out and I, there's always that heifer rodeo in the evening in a lot of places where they run around in the dry part and they just make a bunch of dust. And uh, An interesting way on feedlots, they've shown this, not so much on dairies, uh, but feedlots who only feed, let's say, in the morning, maybe they're not feeding all day or twice a day, you'll get a lot of that activity in the evening. Those cattle are crepuscular feeders, meaning crepuscular means they like to eat at dawn and dusk for the most part. And so when you split their feedings and you feed them in the morning and evening, all of that crazy activity in the evening goes away and they all calm down. 
In dairies, you pretty much have food going all the time, but if you don't, and you do have afternoon act or that evening activity and craziness with some of your strings of cattle, you may want to think about that. And I, could I just, you know, kind of split feeding if I've got that time or labor uh, that I can do that? Just, you know, kind of a way to manage that and idea of that. So there are, and then of course, wetting your roads or applying something on there so that you're not getting that dust production when you're driving around. And your feed areas are another really big one. So mixing feed, or if you don't have those covered in some kind of area, getting blowing a feed, which you can lose thousands plus dollars a year by wind blown feed, um, which is an incredible loss you can have. By just make, you know, you the money you lose on feed, building structures that house that and three-sided makes a huge difference. So those are kind of your big areas for losses. Yeah, one of the unintended consequences of the typical dairy double crop is we have ground cover actively growing, reducing that PM10 in the field. Mm -hmm. You know, if you fly over the valley and you, you look in, in mid to late November, yep. um, you know, that's when we have our, our heavy winds. It's yep. late fall and early spring. Uh -huh. And we're the growers that have got that ground cover on. Yeah. That is preventing that, that PM10 generation. That's right. Yeah, having that cover crop, something on your fields all the time is huge. And there are a lot of other industries that don't have that, and it makes a big difference. That's probably one of the biggest things for your fields, especially for those windblown dust events over roads and everything else that cause big issues. It's always from fallow fields. And dairy, I mean, it's to your benefit to have something going all the time. So um, a few things, so some of these, I'm, when we talk about air quality, and this is a great kind of lead from a question earlier about, well, what conditions in my soil will tell me if I'm going to have a leaching event, for instance. Well, in air quality issues, what conditions? It's all of this. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, but I'm just going to go over a couple of them. Uh, but one thing that has to be said is there are trade-offs with this stuff. So on your farm, let's say in your lagoon, if you're really focusing on reducing hydrogen sulfide issues because you've got some odor, um, challenges, most likely whatever you employ there is going to cause more ammonia volatilization because you're trading off an anaerobic for an aerobic or oxygen for non-oxygen process. And so you're just going to have those trades. Or, or as I mentioned earlier, let's sprinkle pens because you have a big dust problem. Well, too wet, you're going to now trade that off for odor issues. So there's always kind of a trade-off and we do the best with Let's say, okay, here are your objectives for the things you want to work on and stick to that. Um, but that has to be known. Things like temperature, of course, uh, the warmer it is, the greater your loss is going to be from your fields for ammonia. It likes, you know, it, it's almost a nice graph that shows that. Your cows, if you're overfeeding protein, by the way, that's where all that nitrogen comes from that can volatilize. So nailing your protein content for all of your different strings on farm makes the biggest difference in the world. So if it doesn't come out in the first place, we don't have to deal with it. So managing it from the front of your cow first is your best, best method for reducing nitrogen output. And once it's out, uh, then it's things like temperature. The warmer it is, the greater our volatilization. It's that moisture content, as I mentioned. So usually if it's a little bit moist, that keeps things from volatilizing. This is a hard one to balance. Obviously, seasons, it's going to be greater in the summer when it's drier and it's hotter versus this time of year. Um, time of day, even in little fluxes, this can make a difference. If you apply your manure early morning, let's say sunrise time, when winds are calm and we have the greatest amount of moisture in the air, your volatilization rate will be lower at that time versus if you apply in the afternoon with some breeze going. So just the time of day makes all the difference in the world. Wind speed and direction, this is huge. So the direction part is obvious. Who, which way is it going and who is that going to hit if that's a concern of yours with neighbors, etc. Um, the other one is that wind speed. If you're using a big gun for irrigation or manure application or whatever it is, above 10 miles an hour, you should probably shut that down because the amount of drift you're going to get is quite great. I've been nailed by those things um, next to roads a lot to know that it happens. Uh, so that's something insane. Even if you have drop hoses, if they're high, you're going to get the same thing. You're just going to get the stuff blown around and you can't really control your application rate very well if that's the case. So. Um, and of course, uh, your current management, that makes a difference too. Um, one thing with this, 
because there's no silver bullet for this stuff, right? It's every dairy has its own recipe, if you will, for what's going to work. You could all have the same BMP installed on your farm and we could have between a 10 and 100% reduction because of what your current setup is. So that's really, really important. And all this matters to you guys here, um, particularly in the Yakima Valley, because you have to do something about this now. So the Yakima Regional Clean Air Agency has their air quality uh, management policy, which is in effect, which says you need to have an air quality management plan. I believe you also need to pay a small fee to kind of keep that going. And within there, the things that have been developed for you, which went through a pilot process and about a dozen of your fellow dairymen actively participated in making that great right off the bat, um, is that there is a score sheet that someone will come out and go through all this stuff somewhat. They're going to walk through your farm and help identify here, here are some potential issues that we see based on your implementation of different BMPs. And then you kind of get, all right, based on that, here are some BMPs that are recommended. Here's how to do that and install that. So many of you may already have gone through this process, I assume, and have one of those plans. And the hardest part about this is actually keeping it going. So yeah, you can go through this process, but just like your nutrient management plan, once you have this thing, what if you change something on farm, then what? And what if this, what if that? So having someone to ask and uh, having, you've got a few great people here locally, um, consultants that can help, of course, your conservation district and your plans has done dust and odor management, uh, basic practices, and I'm always available as well um, for a call or for a question. So um, there is at least something in place to kind of help you through this process.